So oh, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to our live session today. I will be going over a quick startup presentation to welcome you all to our program and introduce you to pre-health shadowing and the wonderful opportunities we have if you haven't previously been to our shadowing session. Pre-health shadowing is a student-led, minority-led, women-led nonprofit to dedicated to helping prospective healthcare professionals gain access to educational resources, no matter their demographic status, abilities, or location. My name is Muntaha. I am a team member and the editor-in-chief here at Pre-Health Shadowing. And thank you all for attending today. Let's get started. So just a little PSA. We do have closed captioning for all of our sessions to accommodate all students. This setting is available on the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you need assistance, you can uh, direct message me or one of my team members, Susan Chen, and we, are, we will help you if you need assistance enabling the transcript. We are always looking uh, for ways to be more inclusive. So if you have any recommendations, you can definitely email us at info at freehealthshadowing.com. Um, the email is on the screen. So since this is an international program, we'd like to know where you are all Zooming from today. Pre-Health Shadowing is located in California, but um, I'm actually calling from Florida. So you can drop in the chat where everyone's Zooming from. Let's see, a lot of people are from Chicago, nice. We actually have some team members from Chicago too. So we have some wonderful opportunities for you as all uh, benefits of staying in the program. But first we'd like to uh, have you guys know to stay in the loop. We are active on Instagram and TikTok and you can sign up for our email list um, on our website to never miss a session. We keep you updated on the following sessions we have every week. So regarding our opportunities, we have partnered with Kaplan to get students a 10% discount code that can be used on all Kaplan products, as well as free resources such as study guides to help prepare you for standardized testing like the MCAT, GRE, PCAT, NCLEX. So if you fill out our short survey, which will be linked in the chat right now, you can get signed up and have these deals for free. We would also like to draw your attention to another amazing program called Neolith. Neolith is an online mental health platform for uh, pre-health students and uh, other students that aren't pre-health. And we know the path isn't easy. And so that's why we've partnered with Neolith to spread the word and offer free access to their mental health services. You can use the link in the chat or enter the code pre-health when signing up to get access to their mental health services for free. So Mask for Mask is an amazing women-led organization that will donate four masks for every four masks they sell. So these four masks that they donate will be going to people in need during the COVID-19 pandemic. So you can think of these people as um, those in the homeless community, healthcare workers without pro proper PPE and educators and students around the country and just others who are struggling to get through the pandemic. So with our discount code PHS15, you can get a 15% off your order and also um, contribute to donating masks to those in need. If you buy through PHS, you, we will also get 10% of the proceeds, which is amazing because we are a nonprofit that runs solely off the support of our community. If you want to play a bigger role in PHS, you can definitely sign up to be a team member or an asynchronous volunteer. We have a lot of initiatives and we have amazing teams and volunteers, and you can also be the one to lead students in that initiative. So if you'd like to sign up, you can use the links in the chat to either be a team member or an asynchronous volunteer. If you are a high school student and want to get involved, we have a program called HTP, which is High School Training for PHS, which allows you to connect with college pre-health programs and get involved in fundraising for PHS. And, and organize certain resources for other high school students that are interested in medicine and just want to learn more about what health is like and what pre-health is like. We want to recognize the hard work of all of our students in the program. So if you're interested in getting published, you are able to write articles, reflections, reviews of our live sessions and success stories about topics in sociology, neurology, health medicine, and just student life. You can definitely write them up and submit them through the link in the chat and our website at www.prehealthshadowing.com slash blog submissions. I'm the editor in chief and if you do submit, I look forward to reading them. Part of our mission at PHS is to promote diversity and we've launched an initiative 
in which we have a monthly panel discussing like uh, experience, patient experiences, the COVID-19 roundtable and international student forum. So if you have a mentor, professor or any professional that has inspired you, you can definitely nominate them in our panels through using the link in the chat. We, if you can, we humbly ask that you donate. Free Health Shadowing is a nonprofit that runs off of our funding from uh, organizations that donate to us. So keeping our Zoom and website and the many programs we have free and accessible to everyone does take money. So if you are able to donate or know someone who can, please share the link in the chat or click it. Otherwise, we always ask our students to share the uh, to spread the word with, about PHS so as many students can enter and look at the amazing professionals we have speaking with us. Throughout the session today, we encourage you to drop any questions you have for the speaker. Our team members will be making note of these and we will ask them in the latter half of the session. We will be holding a Q&A with our speaker. Take good notes as our professional is going over their presentation. Just as a reminder, we have a post shadowing assessment for every live session that we have, and that is 10 multiple choice questions. And you uh, will be taking this test just to see that you paid attention during the session so you can get your virtual shadowing hours verified with the certificate. So be sure to take good notes. Lastly, if you can, we request you turn your cameras on. This is by no means an obligation, but it does help us feel a little closer when social distancing is mandatory. I appreciate you for listening. And now I would like to welcome our professional, Dr. Zuzuzic. Thank you so much for being here. And thank you students for joining us today. You may share your screen whenever you're ready, doctor. Hi, thank you so much. Absolutely. I look forward to speaking with all of you today. Okay, I'm going to just ensure I can share my sound and then we'll get started here. Okay, good. All right, well, I'm Dr. Stephanie Zizutek. And today what I'd like to do is take you just through the pathway of, you know, where I started post high school and how I got to where I am today, because my pathway is a little bit unique as many of you will have a unique pathway one day and what interests you or what opportunities present themselves or, or changes in technology and healthcare, all the things that, that can happen. No financial compensation for today. All right, just want to run a couple poll questions to see a little bit about who you are before I get started. So this will just help me uh, get a sense of who you are and where you're from. That's one thing about the pandemic that has been really amazing to you know, connect with people from all over the world, all different hours of the day. I can attend you know, more functions and meetings. I can meet with some of my old classmates who live across the country as well, where I hadn't been able to in the past. So this is, so there are, I always try to find the bright side of, of something whenever possible. Okay, about from the Southwest. Okay, well, I'm a Northeasterner myself, um, born and bred and still here. I'm in New York right now. Let's see here we have, um, okay, of, oh, sophomore is clearly <laughs> the most right there. Okay, great. And um, all right, so we have a, some scribes, some medical assistants right now. Okay. Okay, great, and a, a, a few interest in healthcare. Again, this is not holding you to anything for the future. This is just for right now, right? All right, if you had to choose a field of medicine, I'm just I'm thinking, okay, good. We got a couple of joints, which of course is, is my field and my love, um, but I think they're all interesting in their own way. Great. Okay. Well, thank you for uh, answering those. So those are just some of the things that uh, were just on these other slides. I just wanted to get a sense because there's so many things that have transpired over the years. For example, scribes were not around when I was in college. And so that's something that's newer. And a lot of the medical students who come into the classes I teach that I'm gonna share with you, many of them were one of these options here where they were some type of um, medical assistant, EMT, they've 
some of them rode in an ambulance. Some of them did some type of nursing care. Uh, not so many pharmacists, although we did have an optometrist uh, recently who, who joined our class. And it was really interesting to see their perspective on medicine when they came into the medical school instead of having no experience. Now they've had a little bit of experience and see how that might be different from someone who had no experience at all. Okay. And of course, um, these things change as you get experience in a different field or you rotate or you have a shadowing experience in the hospital or a virtual experience. You know, maybe I'll convince some of you to to love OBGYN more at the end of today's lecture, or might say like, wait a second, I didn't know it and followed all that. That's not for me, right? So you never know. All right, so just a general outline for today. So just going over a little bit of my background story, who I am, my pathway to teaching. I teach full time, but I do still see patients as well. So I had a big transition from working in inner city hospitals and doing a lot of hands-on care to doing more simulation care and teaching. And again, I still have a practice, but the, the dynamics of my background have changed over the years. Just being involved, extracurriculars, innovating teaching programs. I have a lot of fun uh, with some teaching programs that we offer. Why did I pick OBGYN? I'll go over a typical day in the life that I experienced, but also students who are in rotations. I had them give me a play-by-play a -play of what they do every day so that you can kind of get a sense of what it's like as a student as well. Different technology, how does influence OBGYN, and then of course Q&A at the end. All right, so my undergraduate major was biochemistry. And once I finished with that, I went on to pharmacy school. So I actually had a kind of a, a more of a segmented pathway to, to get to where I am in medicine. So I went into pharmacy school, loved it, had, had a lot of fun with the pharmaceutical field. I worked with different pharmaceutical companies. I uh, worked in a retail pharmacy. I did all those kind of things. But while I was there, I met a lot of physicians and I always had a love for medicine. And they encouraged me to apply to medical school. And I did. You know, So just a couple of years into pharmacy, I ended up applying to medical school, went to medical school. Once I graduated, um, you know, family, I was getting married, had kids, all the things that go along with that. Um, OBGYN residency was thrown into all of that. And residency for that is four years, joining a private practice, working in a couple different um, places that uh, were in need of OBGYNs as well as where it was near my hometown. And then I'm adding in teaching. And I put in parentheses always because every aspect of all that I did from pharmacy school and beyond, I've always had some type of teaching role, whether it's been medical students or pharmacy school and nurses. So whether I was on a rotation or a resident or an attending, I always had students who were involved with some type of program that I was involved with. So teaching has always been part of my career. And now it's a more officially part of my career with you know being a full-time faculty as well. And then I always say this for yourselves, and I said it to myself back then, you know, if you're 16, 18, 20, 22, what would you tell yourself about your pathway? You can always even write yourself a note for the future. You know, you can write what your goals, your dreams, your wishes are right now, and you can seal it up, you know, put it in a safe or put it in, a, in an area that you'll come to in a couple years. You can even just have a just a notebook where you write some stuff. I always like a little bit of old school with some of the new school technology. I always like to have pen and paper or pencil and paper along with all my tech stuff because I always feel like just that tactile sense of, you know, it gives me, you know, I don't know, just a different understanding of, of my pathway and, and my direction. So I always say, you know, what would you tell yourself now that you wanted to know then and vice versa? What are you interested in now? And then when you look to the future, you can kind of recall what you felt like at the time. So, and you can see how your pathway may have changed. And, you know, I didn't expect to still be in New York, for example. I thought for sure I'd be, you know, in different states or I'd be traveling, you know, the world even more, but it turns out that New York was my calling, you know, so things like that might've been different in my uh, notes. And also I didn't, wasn't sure I wanted to join until I did my rotations as a medical student. I knew I loved women's healthcare. I knew I loved some type of surgical fields. I liked the fast pace of things like that. So, but that can mean lots of different things. Okay. So here's a video that just shows a little bit about my pathway too. My father had a heart attack when I was 
12 years old and I was with them when he had it. So I felt pretty helpless at that time. And I was like, I wish I knew more, like what else I could have done to help my father. Through high school, I rode for the emergency medical services, helped with CPR classes. I ended up going to pharmacy school first. And then once I finished that, then I applied for medical school. This is my hometown, where Torcom Middletown is. And when I found out that they were repurposing this hospital for a medical school, I thought the town really needs this. So I contacted them and said, what can I do to help? How can I be involved? And here I am now. <laughs> Patients don't always share with us everything that they're feeling, or maybe they're having some challenges in expressing how they're feeling. So we really need to be in tune to their nonverbal cues. Because Orange County just has apple farms and horse farms, we're able to integrate that into the program. We reached out, we, de we developed a protocol and a whole program together that really helps students learn nonverbal cues. Horses, they have this ability to, to respond to humans. So if you're being too assertive or if you need to slow down to get the horse to respond to what you need, then you're learning that your actions can also impact how a patient can respond to you. I always loved the professor that I had who just took a challenging topic and made it really clear. So I always have that goal to really energize the students, make things a little bit more fun, but also keep in mind the seriousness nature of the information that we're learning and how to apply it to patients. We use imaging and we use all those types of technologies to help us, but we tell them not to forget that you have your ears to listen to the patient and you have your hands to get to a diagnosis as well and to use that to be the best physician they can be. I'm Dr. Stephanie Zizutek. I am an assistant professor here at Toro College of Osteopathic Medicine. Welcome to Toro. Okay, so that was for my school. They put that together, but I felt like it was really a kind of a nice summary about how I got to the path that I am. So what's fun is the hospital that my husband was actually born in is the same hospital that was repurposed for a medical school. So what what a better use of a, med of a hospital, right, to uh, to make it into the medical school. So like the anatomy lab is in the old OB-GYN suites, you know, so it's, it's really kind of cool to be involved with that. And I used to go to the hospital, you know, to even visit some family and friends at times before it was a medical school. So I feel like it's, it's kind of like it's full circle. So it's kind of a neat thing. So as far as, you know, when I was an undergraduate and when I was in medical school and even now, I always felt that being involved outside of just coursework and just a classroom is so important because you get a better sense of all that is, you know, you get more out of your training and more out of your studies, I believe, because you're, you're learning about how you can be involved in your community, how you can volunteer, leadership roles. This is all gonna help you with future jobs that you have as well. Also health policy and, and working with your local legislators. I didn't really do that that much years ago. And now we have them come speak to the students. We, I work with the medical society and we focus on topics that are in, in need of discussion based on our area, based on malpractice rates, based on on industry in the area. So there's so many different things that you can become involved with and it only enhances the training that you have. Of course, you always wanna balance that out. You need, you need enough time to study, you need enough time to learn the material, but at the same time, I felt that it made me more well-rounded. It made me better appreciate all of the people that I was interacting with and all the programs and functions and meetings that I could attend and conferences. You know? And of course, now with everything, you know being online with the, or a hybrid version where we have some in-person and, and online things, I'm able to attend so many more meetings and conferences and meet with people from all over the world because uh, we're using technology to its fullest. So different clubs. So being a leader in that club, being innovative, um, uh, fundraising. If you have an interest in nutrition, for example, being in a club, you're gonna get even more of a sense of how that can apply to maybe the pediatric population, or maybe the elderly population, or maybe you have um, food deserts in your community and you wanna know how you can better help that community out by healthier food options. So there's so many different roles that you can play from high school, undergraduate, graduate, and beyond. As I mentioned, the leadership roles. So 
being a member sometimes is great and that's what you have time for. But I always you know, recommend that at some point you become uh, involved either on a committee, run for a position, and that only opens networking opportunities and also national roles. Being involved with a national group, you meet people from all over the United States and beyond. It opens up job opportunities, school opportunities that you might not have known about without me meeting that person. So a variety of volunteer roles, for example, things that we do through the medical school that I'm in, involved with, we do programs for Habitat for Humanity, Pets Alive, which is a local program that uh, you know, rescues pets and, and they try to get funds to help um, take care of some of the animals that are there. We also work with the homeless shelter and we do blood pressure screenings and things like that. So there's so many things that we get involved with that really open our eyes to what's in our community and some of the issues that are facing our community that we might not have known about. Research, so research can happen on so many different levels from bench work to clinical work to just surveys, things like that to learn more about a topic that is of interest to you. And then, you know, different things can happen from that, from publications to just presenting a poster at a conference. All of these things are really important to expand your abilities. And then health policy. I have a special interest in health policy because what can we do to make changes? Instead of just acknowledging there's an issue, I want to be a resource behind that to say, okay, this is an issue, but what can we do to improve this? What can we do to make things better? So I found that I did a fellowship in health policy and that helped me uh, better understand the role that I needed to take and the steps that I needed to take to, to be more impactful in making change. Okay, so what's a joy with working with students for many, many uh, years now, but also just being involved on so many community levels and health policy levels, they put together a montage of all the things and I was uh, selected to be teacher of the year back in 2019, which was really just icing on the cake, I like to call it. But at the same time, I wanna share with you because in the video, the students put this together, but it also shows you all the different um, run for downtown and meeting with their legislators and just working with the students, doing an IUD workshop and things like that. They put it all together. So I wanted to share that with you. It's just a couple of minutes, but I felt like it also tells you about my pathway and my role with the students. It shows my family too. <laughs> Hey, Torah students, what's one word we could use to describe our teacher, Dr. Suzuki? Superwoman! Dr. Zizutek had been a key player in establishing the horsemanship and med medicine program here at Turo. Um, and so through the program, we were able to just work on developing our nonverbal communication skills, interact with our classmates and the horses. And so Dr. Z gets all the students excited and Dr. Zizutek um, deserves this award. Patients don't always share with us everything that they're feeling or maybe they're having some challenges in expressing how they're feeling. So we really need to be in tune to their nonverbal cues. Dr. Zizutek is a motivational and inspiring leader. Uh, she uh, has always wanted to be involved with students' activities and uh, student involvement in clubs, and she really does care about uh, student wellness. She's one of those those teachers that uh, means what she says and says what she means. She's a passion for teaching and a motivation for learning. We're all truly inspired by Dr. Zizutek. We hope she wins this award. I am Dr. Stephanie Zizutek. This is really an, an honor that the students nominated me for the Northrop Educator Award. I remember when I was a student and involved with the Student Osteopathic Medical Association, we also selected a faculty at the time, and I feel like it's coming full circle. So this is really such an honor, and I'm so thankful to work with an uh, amazing group of students. I really uh, love teaching. I uh, love the aha moments the students have when we're learning something new in lab or in class, and also 
I really love osteopathic medicine and all that it offers, uh, all the opportunities it offers for the students, for the faculty to get involved and really make a difference. Stephanie's done a, a great job here. She works so well with, with the students, with our background as an OBGYN, uh, currently specializing in GYN. Uh, this has really given uh, our students a lot of clinical uh, exposure and, and great clinical education in this very important field. In addition, uh, Dr. Zutek is uh, very active in the uh, local osteopathic medical society as well as the AOA uh, and has really been uh, a benefit in encouraging the students to be advocates uh, for the osteopathic profession uh, and for medical education and patient care in general. So I applaud um, Dr. Zuzutek for being nominated for this award and uh, our excellent students uh, for choosing her. So that was really such a treat for the students to approach me on that, but also just to put everything together. You know, they're asking for photos and things like that. And you realize all that, you know, you can be involved with. And we really like to support our local community. We have a lot of, you know, creative people in our community as far as, you know, different projects and workshops and things like that. But we have a lot of wellness activities. So where I am in, in New York, it's, not is about an hour and a half northwest out of New York City. So we're not too far from the city if we want to get to the city, but at the same time, we have some horse farms, which you've seen alluded to. So I'm going to give you a little bit more about that because we utilize that as part of our teaching and the nonverbal cues that we were alluding to. So this is very unique to our program as far as there's only a few schools, there's some nursing programs, there's also some other wellness programs that use these type of things, but you need to be near a farm and they have to be specially trained to be able to run this type of program. But just uh, going on hikes, we have this beautiful, some beautiful hiking trails near us, and the students want to get out of the textbook or out of the computer screen sometimes. And I encourage you to find your passion, what gives you that wellness feeling, and to pursue that because we had you know 20, 30 students who would sign up for these events and just the collaboration, the camaraderie, learning more about your classmates, and just uh, you know we had a we had to do this hike was called the lemon squeeze. So you had to really go up these narrow crevices and the students just automatically were uh, helping, you know, like lend a hand, taking someone's backpack and moving it up so that they could fit through these crevices. And when we reflected back on the event, we realized how impactful it was just for us to not only get to know each other, but how that can translate into when you need a hand in school or if you need a hand you know, with personal life or something like that, like they really felt like they had someone they could reach out to. So things like that really just help to just create a great learning environment because school can, can be stressful. You know, you're thinking about your next test or lack of sleep or things like that. And these things really help get you through those tough times. So as far as this unique program, I do like to bring that through because, um, you know, you're learning about all the, all the pathways and steps that some you know, faculty or practitioners take that you you see through these pre-health shattering. So this is something that when I'm training the medical students, what can I do to help them better connect with their patients? What can I do to help them get a better history? What can I do to really enhance all of the teaching? And to me, teaching doesn't just have to be through a computer screen or textbook or things like that. We can enhance it with other things. And this is one of them. So this is a new program to the humanistic side in medicine. So it's called the medicine and horsemanship. So we, you know, some of the footage we have used, but this was where we had the media come because it is such a wonderful opportunity to off offer this in our community. Um, this is a very quick clip, but I thought it was just nice to kind of show the farm a little bit more in detail. Medical College at Orange has a unique approach to teaching its students. It's using horses instead of humans. News 12's Blaze Gomez has the story from the village of Florida. Thank <laughs> you. 
It's not your typical classroom setting. We're working with horses here who are, or are simulating our patients. But for these freshmen at Toro Medical College in Middletown, this course at Raven Hill Farms in Florida is one of their first introductions to medicine, and they're not veterinarians. Oftentimes, you know, you see a patient for 10, 15 minutes and a short visit, you're trying to learn so much about them. So you really have to pay attention to every cue. The idea is if these students can identify a horse's nonverbal cues when it comes to diagnosing a problem, imagine what they can do for people. That's the goal of this obstacle course. I think we need to switch our approach. <laughs> All while focusing on their own body language, skills necessary when interacting with a future patient. When you think of human medicine, horses don't exactly come to mind, but program coordinators here say what students learn inside the barn will help them later in the hospital room. They have to go in and meet new patients all the time, just like with horses, they may need to interact with different horses differently. It's the same thing with patients. They have to modulate their energy. Once they do that and they figure that out, then they have patient compliance. Success seen here <laughs> when the medical students finally got their four-legged patients through. In Florida, Blaze Gomez, News 12. They had a maze that they... Toro oh, is yeah. one of a handful of medical schools nationwide that offer medicine and horsemanship, this program here. It's pretty interesting. So the students had Medical a maze college. that they had to get the horse through, and they were struggling initially, but when they learned how to work together a little bit more, ask for help, they were able to accomplish all their goals. So we generally hold this at the beginning of the school year so that students have the opportunity to meet each other, that they learn other cues, and then we assess them you know, during a practical examination to see how they're able to use these skills and apply it to simulated patients, to, um, to real patients at, at some point in the future. So, you know, throughout the medical school, we use simulation, we use digital things, we, you know, but we try to do hands-on whenever possible. Of course, COVID has thrown quite a few uh, changes and challenges to us for the year, but we still always keep the end goal in mind. All right, so just overall, what's an OBGYN? So many people know in general what OBGYN is, but just to kind of go over a little bit more in detail. So the obstetric part, you know, uh, yes, delivering babies, that's, you know, that in a nutshell, right? But there's other things that go along with that. You have nine months, right, of care for this patient, depending when they come in to see you. Hopefully they come in to see you because we always have a subset of patients who don't get prenatal care. So my blood and be able to treat them when they come in for free. But we, there's also, you know, ectopic pregnancy. So where pregnancy is not implanted in the uterus, but outside of the uterus. What happens if you're monitoring a um, patient and the baby's heart rate drops? You know, what do we do? Always trying to think two steps ahead for what may happen, not always knowing what might, may happen there. Preeclampsia. So that's where someone's uh, blood pressure might be going up or other physical changes that are going on. Placental issues. So if the placenta is blocking the cervix, which is the, the area that the baby generally needs to come through for vaginal delivery, then you know we need to know this. So sonograms are amazing technology. They've changed and just become clearer and clearer over the years. So we generally know these things ahead of time, but you never know. Things can still surprise you at times too. And then of course, C-section. So it is a surgical type of field as well. But it can be operative delivery too. We might need forceps or a vacuum or things like that when we need to help our patients get the baby out. And this is just a quick snapshot of some things. It can have even more than this too. And then the gynecology side of it. So here, we're caring for the reproductive health of women from the time of menarche, so when their menses start, to postmenopausal. So really, this could be really gynecologists can see from very, very young to just a few years old to triple digits, right? In the hundreds, right? We can see patients that, um, that age as well. So very, very common things we see are irregular menstruation. So just, you know, abnormal dysfunction, we call it, or cancers, infections, masses, you know, many of them can be benign but, and cause a lot of problems or patients might have these benign masses and they don't have any problems. We just kind of find it on exam, but they didn't even know they had any any problems. Um, and it is a surgical approach also. So you can do open procedures, laparoscopic procedures. So hysterectomies are very, very common. You can remove cysts. You can do, um, you know, cysts from all over, from 
on the tubes, on the ovaries, on the vaginal walls. There can be lots of different areas that you would need to do these type of procedures. Prolapse, that's where things that, you know, in our bodies, things are supported by ligaments and a uh, tissue. And when those things become weaker over time, they can start to uh, prolapse or, or move to, you know, we, you know, Whereas, for example, like usually you would have to put a speculum in to see a cervix. Someone who has a prolapsed uterus, I might be able to see, see the cervix without even putting a speculum in. That's like an example of something that may happen there. And some of it you can diagnose on exam as well. And then within the field of OBGYN, there's a variety of specialties. So most of those are a couple years beyond. So you have, in, on average, four years of undergraduate. Then you have four years of medical school. And then you have another two to three years of this type of specialty. So you're looking at this amount of time. So you're looking at, you know, um, 12, you know, years sometimes before you can even get into a, a practice, right? So here with there's maternal fetal medicine, urogynecology. So you focus more on your urological system. So anything from urinary incontinence to the prolapse we talked about, or that could be a pelvic uh, reconstruct, uh, reconstruction type of field as well. Minimally invasive gynecological surgery or MIGS. So that's where, you know, looking, you know, just making a small little incision on the patient, putting a camera in, and sometimes we can put different instruments in and just have one port on a patient. Sometimes you can have two or three, but the patient generally can go home that day or just the next day after that type of procedure. There's also reproductive endocrinology and fertility. So that's for patients who have infertility that are trying to get pregnant, or maybe for a patient who isn't getting her period and there's some endocrinological, endocrinological type of problem that's going on. Uh, reconstructive surgery, as I mentioned. And then there's a pediatric and adolescent gynecology as well. So sometimes we can specialize a little bit more in some of these in our practices. If you're in a multi-specialty group or multi you know, um, number of OBGYNs in your group, Many times there'll be a few doctors in that group who will specialize more on laparoscopic procedures. There's also robotic, you know, that's part of the laparoscopic world as well. Someone else might be more comfortable and their forte is more of the pediatric adolescent side. Uh, so there's lots of different approaches that you can uh, take from here. Uh, there's also maternal fetal medicine. Yes, at the top, so that's more of the OB side. Okay, and then what is newer is the OB hospitalist. Now, I've never been an OB hospitalist, nor have I really worked with many because when I was in my residency and training, they just weren't part of the hospitals. But over the last few years, this type of option has really expanded in many areas. Um, there's still some states and there's many hospitals that do not have OB hospitalists, but I wanted to throw it in there because it's another field that you can go into. You don't necessarily have to be specially trained for this per se, but you want, this is really more of like an emergency, medicine doctor who does OB kind of uh, in a way, but of course you're gonna do some GYN too. So here you're caring for all pregnant women who present emergently regardless of circumstance. So if you're covering that hospital and you're doing eight, 12 or 24 hour shifts, depending on the type of program that you're involved with, that's what you're doing. Uh, many times this can affect the call schedule in different private practices. Some of those private practices won't come in unless there's an emergency with your own patient that you're gonna work with the OB hospitals on. Some OB hospitals only cover certain practices. If you have multi uh, number of practices that that admit patients to that hospital, not, er, not every patient might be covered by the OB hospitals or the OB hospitals may cover all of the patients that are uh, presenting in labor or there'll be another assistant on another type of surgery. But in general, they're supporting private practices and caring for generally unassigned patients, but they can also care for many of the assigned patients that you'll just be in contact with the doc with the group and the doctor who's on call for that group. And that doctor may not have to go in the hospital as much. Whereas my practice, I was on call, you know, every third or fourth day and I had to go in anytime a patient arrived that needed my care. So monitoring um, labor, delivering babies, performing surgery, uh, assisting other doctors in in that type of, uh, any type of surgical procedure, evaluating treating postpartum, rounding patients, other type of support for other team members, emergency drills and simulations. These are ongoing things, clinical trials, um, and then different types of rounds and things like that. So generally what's nice about this is if you want to really go to your job and when you're done with your shift, you're done. 
those are, this is like an emergency medicine doctor in that respect. You know, you're going in and then when your day is done, generally you're off. So here, and say you want a full week off every month or even two weeks off. Like if you wanna work really hard those first two weeks um, and then you want the last two weeks off, sometimes that may be right for you. Um, generally, you're not on call because you're just working when you're working. But once you're off and you're out of the hospital, you don't have to carry your cell phone. There's some places that might still have a beeper or a pager. You know, I don't know how many programs still have those, but I'm sure some still have them. It did transition during my training where I had a beeper and then it went into cell phone. And truthfully, I told the nurses, just call myself because by the time my beeper goes off, I turn it off and look at the number, call, and then find out which nurse was calling me. That's too much time. I'm like, just call myself. <laughs> Okay, so why OBGYN? Why did I go to OBGYN? So I love women's health, of course. You're just being female, learning about the human body and just all the things that are actually kind of normal that didn't seem normal, right? Um, variety of healthcare needs. So, so many different aspects of healthcare needs from nutritional support to OB to GYN to adolescent care to, you know, geriatric type of care, all mixed in in the same type of field. So my one day isn't necessarily the same as another day. So office care plus the surgical field. I really like both aspects. I like going to the office, but I also really like being in the hospital in, in the operating room or suite, as some of us call it, or theater, as some you know, international places call the operating uh, suite, right? It's not a typical nine to five. So again, the OB hospitals might, might make a little bit more of that nine to five, but I know that I, I was okay with not being a typical nine to five. To me, that, that suited me well. Scrubs with a smiley face. I love scrubs. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm gonna wear them all the time. So there it's like no holds bar, like button spills, no problem. I could just change my scrubs. Like, whereas if you're in regular clothing, you know, you know, mask of course and shields all the time. But in this case, I'm like scrubs, I felt like very free and, and didn't care so much about uh, just getting my hands dirty if I needed to help a patient out. And of course in the OBGYN world, there's fluids, there's blood, you will definitely get you know, some type of speckle to a whole flood uh, on you at some point in your career. Just being an advocate for patient's health. It's really amazing when a patient comes in and I'm able to share a story um, or to give some advice and all of a sudden they're like, I didn't even think I could do that. And something, you know, that could be very basic and simple and, and they just didn't think of it. So it's really, it's really nice to and an opportunity to make a difference. All right, so then this is just the general wheel of OBGYN, I call it. You know, days are never the same. A lot of it is preventative care. You know, we want to ensure our patients are healthy and stay healthy. I find that OBGYN is really a mixture of both primary care and specialty care. So I do a lot of primary care, checking for like a urinary tract infection in the office, or I still have my, you know, I, I have the stethoscope, I can listen to lung sounds or whatever, you know, might be going on, not, you know, not just the, the baby sounds, right? Then surgery to antepartum care. So how is the patient during the pregnancy, delivering the baby, following them postpartum, um, continuity care. So if you like continuity care, then regular office-based practice is more for you. If you like the just action and just, you know, working when you're working and not working when you're not, that's where you'll be hospital. You might not have the continuity, but there are definitely some positive things for all of the things that I'm in. Healthier patient population in general. I knew that oncology wasn't for me, but there's many times I have diagnosed cancer in patients as well. So it is something that uh, is certainly part of our practice from breast cancer, uterine cancer, ovarian cancer, vulvar cancers, things like that. And I also like that I could see patients from very young to very old and, um, and just really be all part of the whole package. So lots of benefits, but there are some cons that have to be considered. So high malpractice rates. Now this is variable from across the United States, and you know, you know, internationally it's a little bit differently because uh, different types of socialized medicine and things like that. Um, but I don't know if if you everyone else just put in the chat room real quick. Like, what do you think? Like, if you pay insurance, like you know, like car insurance, you have to pay thousand or two thousand dollars for your car insurance as a teenager in early twenties. But what do you think a malpractice OBGYN rates would be for per year. Does anyone want to throw something in the chat room? So put an actual number. So you, is it like 10,000, 50,000, you know, 100,000, those kind of things like that. 
All right, so I'm seeing 14,000, 10 to 25, 30, 20. So I'll tell you, okay, thank you for, uh, <laughs> yeah, there you go. So Shana, yes, so 100,000, yes. Yeah. So for New York in my area, it's $140,000, for example, just to be able to see patients. Whereas if you go to Arkansas, maybe the rate there is about 30,000. So it's very much of a wide range, but it does affect your management of patients because you need to be able to pay for malpractice insurance to be able to practice for insurance companies to cover you. So, but this talk isn't about that. I was just trying to see like where, what your sense was because I had no idea when I was an undergraduate student, like what the malpractice rates were. And of course they've changed over the years. So erratic schedules. So we mentioned not typically the nine to five. However, um, it can be really erratic at times. Say you're doing a 24 hour or you're doing a night shift. Um, you may not get any sleep at all. You might have patients that you're seeing on labor and delivery. You might have to go to antiparm to see a patient. Maybe the emergency room is calling. You're not even ectopic pregnancy that's coming in. Maybe you have um, other patients that are calling from the office just to ask questions about a medications that you prescribed the other day and they, they're not sure if their reaction is normal or not. So your care might be, you know, you might really be very busy. For example, I started a call one time at 9 a.m. or excuse me, um, 6 a.m. on a Friday morning and didn't finish until Monday morning at 6 a.m. And I barely got any sleep in because I had about 14 deliveries, a set of twins, uh, antipartum patients, an ectopic pregnancy. And this was all <laughs> in one weekend. And then other weekends, you know, may not be so busy and you can, you know, get some rest and, you know, do your thing. So, all right, so sleep deprivation. So you have to know who you are. If you're definitely the type of person who wants to go to bed at 10 and you know get your eight hours of sleep in, OBGYN may or may not be for, for you. But again, with OB hospitalists, maybe, that, maybe it's a little bit different now, right? There's also the administrative side of medicine. This is not unique to OBGYN. However, this is the stuff that we don't love so much. I like to see patients. I like to, to get their history and examine them and do procedures and tests and, and try to find you know solutions or, or just preventative care. Here, you know, you have electronic medical records and different charting and forms to fill out, insurance issues, pre-authorizations, all these things, coding changes. So this is a part of all healthcare. And this isn't always the fun part for me. But and then family life. Your family life can be impacted. So if you're in a group of 10 OBGYNs, maybe you'll do one in 10 calls. So it's what three, four times a month. That's not such a big deal. But if you're in a practice with only three docs, you have to take 10, 10, 11 calls a month. So then it can be impactful. Um, so weekends were golden, you know, like on my residency and also my practice, like I always wanted to have at least one full weekend off so that I could go hiking or I could plan like a small getaway with my family or friends or things like that, or just sleep <laughs> or read a book or listen to a book, whatever is going on with any of those ones. So missing bedtime for self and kids. So I used to joke that, um, you know, a lot of OB t seems to have a baby at 2 a.m. I don't know why. So I got called out a lot to go in to do a delivery. Um, but at that point, I didn't mind it because I got to put my kids to bed and I could do my job and still be home. And actually, I could still make them breakfast. Um, I actually left for the hospital in time. I came home around 530 in the morning. I lay down for another hour or two. And my husband's like, oh, well, you had a quiet night. And I was like, I was just at the hospital for five hours. And he didn't even know it. So fortunately, he did sleep through it. But I was able to get out, you know, get the kids to school and stuff like that. So you modify your life to make it fit. Um, ethical quandary. So within OBGYN, there may be some type of things that you're comfortable doing, not comfortable doing, or just uh, different um, from blood, you know, blood transfusions to abortions, those kind of things like that. Those can cause some ethical quandary. So you have to see who you are and what type of you know, practice you want to have. And then um, competitive residencies. I throw that in now because OBGYN uh, residencies have become very competitive over the last few years. So it, it kind of goes in waves, but right now um, I have many students who um, are looking to get into a residency and it's very tough at times. Okay, so this is just a general day in life. I've gone over this a little bit, but just, you know, really quick snapshot here. So I wake up, you know, uh, you know also your wellness. Are you, are you the type of person who works out you know, I am. So I was trying to make sure I had at least, you know, 20, 30 minutes for that. Even if I can't during that day, if I get a break, I try to at least get a walk in, um, a, you know, gym memberships or things like that, whatever works for you. Uh, there's all these apps now and uh, that you can do, or you can have your own gym in your home, whatever it is, but I always find whatever works for you, but wellness is so important. 
Um, caffeine, are you a caffeine person? I'm actually not a coffee drinker. I am a tea drinker, so I don't need that to get up and go. But um, if you do, make sure you have your coffee pot set or you have your um, you have your um, curry or whatever you're gonna do, right? So um, planning for the day, like, um, am I gonna be on call that day? Am I coming home? What are we doing for dinner? Are there kid activities? Are there you know, other activities? Are we gonna go see a movie? What you know? What what's the plans for the day? So in routing on patients, do I have any patients admitted? Do I need to write any charts? Do I need to um, do any callbacks, chart reviews, seeing patients on the floor? Do I have any surgery scheduled? What may be going on there? And then lunch, I put a question mark there because sometimes I don't always uh, get a set lunch or I'm eating on the run or I'm eating while I'm doing some notes. Or, uh, completing charts, that's one thing. Try not to let things build up because otherwise um, that can be a challenge to um, your day because you're like, oh, I had, I have like 10, 15 charts I got to do. And then also you don't want to forget any details from a patient visit. So you want to make sure you have that down, at least at a minimum, I try to put down my exam for the patient um, because I don't want to forget key points that I want to, to include. But I do certainly try to get my notes done as quickly as possible so that I don't have it build up. Um, and again, more seeing patients. Do I have other OR time? Is it a post-call day where sometimes maybe I only have half a day that day to work? Um, documentation, of course, again. Do I need to schedule surgery? Do I need to do pre-op for a patient? So all these things are running through my head and this is kind of changes from day to day. And then right around the six, so it's usually like six to six is usually a good time to consider dinner, sleep, checking emails, checking, um, doing continuing medical education, studying for boards, license exams, if that's something that you're doing. Um, and then post-call, am I on call? Do I, am I doing other charts, completing dictations? And then the day starts again. So that's like a very quick snapshot. So I know I've mentioned a lot of things and there's some things that I did not include in here, but it may change from day to day. And then here's for a student who just did a third year rotation at the medical school that I'm at. And here, so she, she also gets up quite early. And um, so she hits her snooze quite a few times before. So she sits already. She pre-plans that in her snooze, uh, snoozing. So if that's what you need. Um, so she listens to podcasts. So she feels that that's her best way when she travels into the hospital, that when she listens to her podcast, she's still getting her study in, but um, she's doing it, you know, like multitasking in that way. So she knows she has to do rounding. She has to check the OR schedule. What is she? And then I recommend that you check the OR schedule the day before if you're a student, because now you're going to look at the cases that you're going to be involved with and study, read up on them so that when you're in the OR, you know what to expect to some degree. Because the, the worst thing I feel is when you don't even know the questions to ask because you don't know enough about that topic. So I find that if you really prepare, at least have a general sense of what's going on, it really is helpful. So are you on the OB team? Are you on the GYN team? All those things make a difference. And then of course, when the baby is delivered, you know, the adorable babies, when you hear them cry, when, you know, you the fun side of medicine, you check it with mom, like, so what are you naming your baby? You know, so there's some fun things that you can really do in this field. She has a few snacks that are packed. Um, and this is still before 10 a.m., right? So, <laughs> so she's checking labs. Uh, students, we have them, you know, run, literally run down to the lab to get results sometimes or, especially when things are sat or to just to help us get things moving, moving along. So is she helping out with other surgeries? Um, is there a grand rounds? Is she listening to any lectures, presentations? She's meeting with anesthesia. Is she, you know, checking other patients, doing sign out. So there's, it's very, very active. Okay, so other fun side, right, in this field. So pregnancy care. So students who come in, this is great because you get to um, many sonograms are right on offices or on labor and delivery. So we can just scan the patient and we're taking a look. Uh, here we see the baby, here's the nose, you know, here's the head, we see the, the belly here, here's fluid, this is the cord right there. So there's lots of things you can see in real time. You see the baby moving, you can listen to the heart rate. And these are some things that the students can do even. And other things too, examining for the mom, like how, they think the baby is because how large the uterus is there's different types of weeks that correspond to different phases of the pregnancy and then you know what's happening inside you know we're examining all these things on the outside but it's really happening on the inside and then the trimesters months of pregnancy you know different education that we have to give our patients different lab tests sonograms um anatomy scans genetic testing whatever may be part of that 
uh, patient care? And then does the mom have other medical problems? Is she diabetic? Is she hypertensive? Do we need to run different labs? Do we need to uh, check other things? And now, you know, with COVID and, you know, can we give a vaccine? How do moms do if they are exposed? What, what do we need to do? So all these things, you know, so it's a never ending learning process that's going on. And then there's checking how far is someone dilated. So there's so many ways that you can practice, but really the best way to do it is to actually have a patient that you have your resident or attending who examines and you examine and, and you assess to see how far the patient is dilated. And then not only dilation, but how thin is that cervix getting, which is what's called effacement. So dilation and effacement. So if you're at home and you want to practice any of this stuff, here are some fun ways that you can do this on your own. So a pillow and a doll, so say you're gonna put the baby head down, so it's vertex. You know, you can have someone else do it and you can try to feel through the pillow to see if the head is down or if the head is to the side or is the head up like a breech baby. Um, there's also like a small bowl, a penny. An Oreo cookie actually can be a couple centimeters dilated. So if you put your fingers around the cookie, then that is a, a way to see what four centimeters might be, right? A penny could be, you know, two centimeters, you know, um, Fingertip is usually like a centimeter. A soda can, a baseball, a roll of toilet paper. Who knew roll of toilet paper can be about um, 10 centimeters, you know? And then of course the ruler to, to really be able to get a sense, a sense of how you can document that cent the centimeters the patient's dilated. So there's ways that we can have a little fun with this too. And we do this with students and high school students um, as well. We have a MediT program where students uh, come into the medical school and they learn all the different aspects of medicine and this is one of the fun things that we do with them. And then sonogram. So not just for OB but we use this a lot for gynecological problems. So we're looking for how thick the lining of the uterus is. Are there any polyps, masses? Is there an IUD? Like what's going on with the endometrium that we can you know help our patients if they're having some irregular bleeding? And here's some other common findings. So these are cysts. So ovarian cysts are very common. So we have what's called an endometrioma. You can see like this blue hue. So there's definitely some blood in there. Um, this is the uterus right there. Here we have the ovary and then we have a cyst right there. Here's another you know, huge cyst that had to come out for this patient. And this is a sonogram picture of a cyst that had clear fluid. in. so this could have been clear fluid, um, but we can see different views of this. And this might be an open case. This might be a laparoscopic case. So there's lots of different ways. And this is very common that um, I see in my field all the time. And then technology and GYN. It's really advanced so dramatically over the last decade. So just having different apps to track your period, to track your fertility. So I have many of my patients who maybe take medications that these might alert them to take the medications. This might be a way for them to really check out when where they are in their cycle. This is just a snapshot of many of the popular ones. There's more than this, of course. So simulations, using simulators. These simulators can talk, they can blink, they can cry out in pain, they can bleed. So the simulators nowadays have really advanced in our ability to be as real as possible without having a real patient. We can have monitors in the background, we have uh, BP screening for these patients. Then we have an advancement in the type of sonogram, so 3D, 4D, and beyond, where you can really see the outline and you can you know, look for any problems that maybe you can address during uh, the pregnancy or be aware afterwards. Robotics, you, know, you don't even have to be in the same room with the patient sometimes if you wanna do a laparoscopic uh, robotic surgery. So, and it's very fine too. And some of these uh, movements are even finer than your own hands could be because of how the instruments uh, turn. So it's really um, an amazing technological advancement and who knows what, what's to come in the future, right? All right, here, uh, you always have to have a little bit of fun to, um, with the technology too. So at which trimester will I be able to communicate with my baby via text? So I don't know if that'll ever happen, but <laughs> you know, it would be pretty impressive, right? And then it's a new medical technology. Instead of crying, we can program a choice of 200 fun ringtones. <laughs> so just a little um, OB humor there, okay. All right, so now I have a lightning round of OBGYN questions. So we're gonna put some other polls up because, because I work with undergraduate students many times or high school students. Um, I try to bring in like some common questions that maybe you'll get while you're working with some patients or just in general that maybe you didn't realize about the field of OBGYN. So we're gonna start the, the lightning round now.
Okay, so so how many OBGYNs are there in the United States? So for all of my students, I will be ending the poll in a few seconds, but the question is, how many OBGYNs are in the United States? The first answer is 10,000, 25,000, 40,000, 75,000, or 100,000. So just giving a few more seconds and sharing the results now. Okay, so it's actually... <laughs> So I'll go over some of the answers that we're all doing. So it's actually like closer to 40,000, but there's so many trainees. And um, so I didn't know, like some of these, I wasn't even sure, like how many, how many, you know, colleagues do I have? So, okay, we can go to the next one. Because <laughs> I always want to network with other people who do the same thing I do to share cases or to learn from my own colleagues. All right, average blood loss during menstruation. So for a typical menstrual cycle, how much do you think a patient loses? So they've done studies on this. This is not something we do um, in our general practice. Just a couple more seconds. Um, we'll share the results. Exactly. So right, 50 to 60 mLs. And what's important here is that if a patient is bleeding heavy, then they're at risk for anemia, blood transfusion, those type of things. So we want to know kind of what's normal so that we can know when we need to manage our patients or treat our patients or prevention, what may be happening there. Okay, so we can go to the next one. How many menstrual cycles does a female have in her lifetime? So this is something the medical students actually had a, a fun a wellness workshop. And this was one of their questions there. And This plays a role when you have to think about how many menstrual products that some women have to have, what if they can't afford to have them, other countries where they have limited supplies. So this is something that was really impactful to, to understand. So it's actually, um, <laughs> it's, it's actually closer to 350, but if for some women, it can certainly be more. If you start younger and older, it could be a little bit more. So uh, yeah, all right, so the next question. So I'll give it both credit because I, I used to say close to 400 anyway. So, <laughs> all right, at birth, a girl is born with her complete egg supply. How many eggs is she born with? And then how many are present at puberty? So this is a question that um, you can have in embryology class, you can have in <laughs> um, on your rotations, in your women's health class. Yeah, so 2 million to 400,000. So huge number in utero. And then by the time um, you're born, it's close to 400,000. But of course, you're not going to ovulate, right? 400,000 times. So you have all of these eggs that are working with your hormone levels and how your, how your body is functioning. So at this case, um, how many years the patient is having her menstruation, all this plays a role. What if someone has premature um, me um, menopause or other things that may, or premature, you know, um, or polycystic ovarian syndrome, all these things can play a role. Okay, we'll go on to the next uh, question. Average age a women's menstruation stops. In the United States, this may be different in different countries sometimes, um, but this is for the U.S. Three more seconds. Yeah, so 51 in the United States. However, Anything in the late 40s through even the mid 50s is still considered a normal range. So all of the things that we talk about are generally in a range. Usually it's not always one hard and fast number. Um, but if I have a patient who is 39 and she stops her period, that's premature. If I have someone who's 55 and they still have a regular menstruation, that's a little less usual. And so do I need to investigate what may be going on? Okay, so we'll go to the next uh, question. 
Female astronauts have normal menses when in space. This was something I learned while preparing for this lecture. <laughs> I wanted to look at some other fun, uh, fun questions that I wasn't aware of. It's actually true from what they say. Like, you know, of course I'm, I'm basing it on the people who you know, like share all this information, <laughs> but it's actually true. So that doesn't change. Although bone mineral density and things like that can change in space because of gravity uh, or lack of. So there are changes that can happen and with, with men as well too, with bone changes, but apparently the menses stay right on track. All right, the next uh, question. Average weight of a baby at birth. This is in pounds. Okay, so it's just the first two. <laughs> so 7.5 is it, although I feel like with nutrition and prenatal vitamins, that babies seem to be getting bigger uh, <laughs> lately. Um, but yep, 7.5. And so we usually calculate baby's weight in pounds and in kilograms too, which is usually like 3.1 or 2 uh, kilograms or so. Um, so you may see it listed both ways. And then of course we we measure babies too, you know, what's the average in inches. So although we use metrics for many things, inches and pounds are still used in the U.S. for, um, <laughs> for evaluating patients. All right, next, uh, Lightning. All right, largest baby at birth. This was my daughter. She's the one who asked me this question. <laughs> I said, I'm not sure, let's look that up. So. <laughs> on record, right? They may not all be on record. It's actually 22 pounds on record. <laughs> so, but personally, my large baby is around 11 pounds that I've delivered, but so that's very unusual. So yep, 22, that's what it said. <laughs> I think it's in the Guinness Book of World Records. Though. Okay, next question. Just a few more that we have here. All right, expected weight gain in pregnancy. This is, can be a sore topic for some patients to hear, but it is important to, to keep in mind for the average weight patient, what is their normal expected weight gain? Yes, you got it right, 25, 35 pounds. Now, if the patient is overweight or obese, it might it would be less, or say they have twins or tulpas or something else, and sometimes those numbers don't always play a role, but this is a general sense. All right, so we just have a couple more fun questions, then I'll get to your, your question. All right, and besides humans, what mammals undergo menopause? So, you know, it's not unique to just uh, to us, right? Um, so it's actually elephants. So uh, just something to, you know, keep in mind how, um, <laughs> how we might be similar, you know, across different, you know, people, animals, things like that. Okay, and is there any more, uh, do I have one more on the, uh, the lightning round? Let me check. Um, no, that was the last one. Okay, that was the last one. Okay, so that is just about done. Those are just the questions that we had here. Oh, I just showed like this chart, the medical students need to know about, even in undergraduate, if you're doing anything to get to, with hormones, this is really important to understand the relationship of the pituitary gland to the ovaries, to how does it, how does the uterus respond? So this is something that was really important. How does ovulation know to happen? All those kind of things that go along with it. Um, so 
I just I'm just throwing out some things that are so important to understanding why our bodies work the way that they do. Um, just different follicles. So we can see even here, you know, 400,000. But so uh, there's there's uh, follicles in here that will never ovulate. So you're going to have, you know, your ovary will still have uh, this potential, but you know, only you know in the 400s, right, or close to 400 will ovulate. So um, and then uh, let me see here. This is a strip for the uh, fetal heart tracing. Um, so this was just, you know, talking about what normal heart rates are. What do we look at when a patient is on the floor? There is contractions. There's different heart rates. We look for fetal viability. We look for um, baseline rates. All these things that we're we're looking at. So lots of sounds on labor and delivery that you can hear. Um, we talked about weight gain there. The elephants. Okay. And then now I'm gonna. Um, stop sharing and I'm going to open up for um, any questions that you have. Well, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. We've all enjoyed it, especially the questions I learned a lot. I did not know elephants also have the menstrual cycle. <laughs> so for our questions, a student is asking about amenorrhea. Um, so with that question, let me just go up. Uh, they ask, how do you treat patients with amenorrhea from psychological causes such as anorexia? Okay, so what's important there is we want to be able to determine what might be causing amenorrhea. So number one, you know, we want to make sure a patient's not pregnant, right? Because that's, that's high on the list of why a patient is amenorrheic. But putting that aside, what else is going on? Is it the patient's weight, nutrition? Is there something to do with the function of the ovary or that hormone chart that I showed, is there some imbalance with that chart? So there's, so one is we wanna find the root cause and be able to manage it that way. And as far as um, there was some, some psychological question, what, what was your meaning for that? Um, the uh, uh, audience member asks, if there were psychological causes like anorexia, how would you treat am amenorrhea? Okay, so that I would put more of a um, metabolic cause is more than psychological, although if it's psychological that led to that, um, but because there's, you know, the, you can live without your period, right? You can't live without your heart beating, without your lungs getting, you know, air, those kind of things like that. But if your body mass index is really low um, and your nutrition is low, then your body needs to make sure it really keeps all the high functioning um, things in check. You can live without your period. So that one isn't going to um, kick in. So if someone doesn't have their period, there's often something that is contributing to that. So even I have a few marathon patients. Uh, they train for the marathon. Uh, it's what we call the athletes triad. It's one of the uh, old names for it. Um, but they their body is repairing muscle and joints and tendons and um, whether their nutrition may or may not be off, but um, that's when the, sometimes the cycle is saying, you know, we're going to put this on pause while we make sure that everything else is functioning okay. So, um, but in the field of OBGYN, you know, there are a lot of um, mood changes, uh, psychological needs. So we just try to collaborate, you know, try to find out, is it a hormone thing? Is it something where we need um, a specialist to work with our patients as well. You know, we try to handle what we can, but we do often have to seek or have the patient seek additional care when needed at times. Thank you for that answer. Another question regarding women's health. Jasmine asks, can a pregnant mom who has COVID pass it on to the baby? I read somewhere that if the mom is vaccinated, she can pass the antibodies onto the baby. So they are still doing a fair amount of um, research and they're looking into all of this right now. Um, I don't believe there's any case reports of the baby having COVID from a delivery, um, but be, when the mom has COVID, she is automatically developing antibodies. And of course, if she gets a vaccine as well, and they have shown that to be present in the baby and they've tested cord blood, they tested the baby. So um, right now that's what they know, but more to come on that. They're still doing more research. We don't even, we don't know all the long-term effects yet for the person themselves. If the baby, you know, was exposed and the mom say was on a ventilator, um, is that going to cause any long-term problems that are, we're not aware of yet, but so far the babies have been okay. The mom, um, 
you know, the moms who have recovered, you know, sometimes it takes them some time, a couple of weeks or even months before they can even hold their baby. But, um, and of course, those who are vaccinated, um, they've shown some antibody transfer. Thank you for that answer. Um, an audience member asks, what are the health risks, if any, involved for students or for women who continue to get their menstrual cycle past the age of 50? So generally, no, no health risks overall. Um, you know, actually, you know, the menstrual cycle as, you know, five to seven days of a cycle can be kind of a, a nuisance at times with bleeding and um, fatigue or, you know, sometimes headaches or things like that can come with your, you know, fluctuation in your hormone cycle, but it really is so important for your bone health, your skin health, your hair health, your just overall well-being. So without the period, uh, women do miss it because, you know, um, there's all these other changes that are going on. So you want to, um, so if someone goes beyond 50, it's generally not a problem. It's really when they're getting you know, 53, 54, 55, what may be going on. I find that women who have fibroids or these benign growths on the uterus, they sometimes tend to um, go a little bit longer just because of the stimulus on the uterus or, or what may be going on there. But um, generally speaking, it's okay um, to go beyond 50, but you wanna just assess your patients, make sure they're healthy, make sure they're getting their preventative screening done from mammograms, pap smears to, um, any other tests that need to be done. So say a woman is in her 50s, does she need a thyroid check? Does she need her lipid or cholesterol levels checked? Does she need a colonoscopy? Um, so I, you know, I'm not gonna perform the colonoscopy, but I'm checking in with the patient because again, we're floating between that primary care and that specialty care. So I do like a quick, uh, I have a quick preventative list that I just check with my patients based on their age, based on their risk factors. And I wanna just make sure that they're staying healthy. And again, prevention is key to to creating um, a, he a healthy lifestyle. Thank you. Uh, Kat is asking, how do you treat endometriosis? So endometriosis can be managed in many different ways. Um, it really depends how, how does the patient feel. So some patients might have it really mild and they're not that symptomatic. You might also have patients with no symptoms and they have it. And then you have the other side of the spectrum where patients are really significantly affected by this, where they have a lot of pain and this might not be just during the period, it could be during other times of the month. It can also affect the bladder, the bowel, things like that. So really depending on the severity, uh, we talk to the patients whether we wanna do more um, medication type management where we can try to regulate their cycles, maybe pause their cycles through medication. Sometimes there's surgical management where you can go in and sometimes patients will have adhesions or removing implants. Some patients actually opt to even have their ovaries removed because they're done with childbearing and they know that that is part of the source of, you know, supplying, you know, some of the, the endometriosis. So endometriosis for anyone who doesn't know what it is, it's just when you have the lining of the uterus that isn't just in the lining, it's outside of that uterus. And usually it plants around the uterus, but I mean, it can certainly go onto bowel and bladder, as I mentioned. And sometimes we have to have your urological team, general surgery team in for different surgical cases because the patient has such dense adhesions that um, it is causing a lot of problems for this patient. So uh, for some patients, we really have to work as a team. And then we also wanna look at the patient's fertility desires. If she's not done with childbearing, then we don't wanna remove those ovaries, right? Unless she has another plan where she's gonna keep her uterus and have a, a donor egg. So, I mean, there's a lot of avenues that we can you know, go down, but how symptomatic is a patient? What are their desires for treatment and management? And to know that once we start treatment, if that's effective, great. If it's not, we can move on to something a little bit more um, assertive to help our patients as well too. It's really impressive how you balance all of these uh, conditions and circumstances of the patient to fit their needs. Thank you for that answer. Sure. Um, Jasmine uh -huh. asks, why did you pick DO versus MD? And do you see any stigma around NDO around DOs in medicine? And if so, how do you deal with it? You know, it's been, a, you know, oh, some changes so over the so years between MD and DO. But for me, you know, our training is really a parallel pathway, except, you know, we have the osteopathic manipulation, which I greatly appreciate. I love, you know, being able to get hands-on early hour with my patients. I actually, through pharmacy school, my anatomy professor is the one who let me know about the DO school. And I really love their philosophy 
it was also in New York and I was going to stay. I ended up staying in New York. That's where I wanted to go. And I really love my training. I think that there, I'm really more about overall wellness, preventative care, you know, but utilize my skills as a surgeon, utilize my, sk my skills as an OBGYN to help my patients out. So for me, um, the testing is similar, the, you know, the general training is similar, but I just feel like I have another option that I can help my patients manage pain or manage um, maybe reduce medication or things like that. It's just another option that I feel like we all are enhancing our training with so many different avenues. And to me, this fit me and I, I love it. And now there's, you know, um, you know, I also served on national committees, you know, working with the osteopathic schools and also um, this medical school, as I mentioned from the one video, it's really literally just a few miles from where I grew up. And the fact that it's in my neighborhood and we're keeping doctors in the area where, where I'm at was a huge need for, for doctors to stay in the area. It's, you know, I feel like this is that full circle where it's, it's coming full circle. And I'm so appreciative of having it in our community. That's awesome. Um, Kamsha asks, what is the most memorable moment in your practice so far? I would have to be more like a top 10, right? <laughs> There's so many different yeah. things. Um, you know, uh, you know it's, it's really depends on where I was in my life and was I an OB or GYN? You know, like OB, you know, when I, you know, had a patient who um, both C-section rooms were being utilized and here I have a patient, she's eight centimeters dilated and the heart rate is dropping and we need to get this baby out. What do we do? So we're calling in the team. We have to call in a third team for this hospital, which they're not in house because this is a third team, which is almost unheard of to call in. And um, so, you know, working with the patient to say, I'm going to get you, you know, delivered. Let's push with me. Let me try to, you know, um, get you to fully dilated. And, you know, within 15 minutes, we have this baby out. And all of us were just still amazed and tears, you know, um, you know, in, in the room that, uh, the baby was crying and had good apgars and stuff like while you're going through it you know that you know 15 30 minutes is really really uh high energy you know some stress you know i would say i'd be fully gray right <laughs> if it were to show out like show up on my head um so stuff like that has always been or diagnosing you know cancer in an 80 year old patient who felt like her life was over and i said this is stage one. I said, no, I said, um, the treatment for this is a hysterectomy. I said, and you're going to get back to your normal routine. And she comes back to me, you know, and she's just so thankful that she didn't just, you know, let it go and, and not get the care that she needed. And she was still working. She was my 80 year old patient. She was still working and she still worked until she was about 86 or 87. Um, so like stuff like that just is really impactful to, to help a patient better understand their own bodies and to know that they, they have support and a resource through their, their doctor. Those are just a few in a snapshot. I have many others where, you know, I'm on a patient has a cord prolapse, my hand is holding the cord in while they're bringing me into the operating room and the anesthesia is getting called and everybody else. Or, you know, when we had a uterine rupture on the floor and it happened uh, because we saw the electronic fetal scalp monitor move into the patient instead of out of the patient when she was pushing. So, I mean, just these amazing stories. Um, or I had a patient comes in and she says, I feel like I, I'm in a little bit of pain. And she was eight to nine centimeters dilated. I mean, so, <laughs> I mean, I have thousands of stories. My students will tell you as well. Um, but, you know, just being able to help patients and, you know, and, you know, one patient walked into my office one time when I helped her and she says, thank you. You gave me back my, my life back, you know, just for some something that wasn't so crazy in the field of OB2AM, but just the fact that I could impact her and help her better to be a better her would really help me uh, appreciate the little things. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, we had another question regarding hospital exchanges. So a student asks if a, stu uh, if a woman who's pregnant is really late to the hospital and she isn't able to make it on time, what do you recommend they do? 
So she feels she's just a push ready, is that what you're saying? Yeah. <laughs> well, um, in that case, you know, anytime you're pregnant, you know, we want patients to have some type of plan in action. You know, where do you plan on delivering? You know, we actually have many patients now who do choose to go to either like a labor center or to um, home delivery, you know, so there's pros and cons to all of that. So the topic isn't about that right now. So for them to have something, um, a plan in action, um, but you're right, some patients might go from zero to fully in a short amount of time. So, you know, call your EMS services. So many EMS, you know, have delivered on the field. Um, you know, we've had patients deliver in a taxi um, as they got to the hospital and the baby is there and the poor shocked, you know, taxi driver. <laughs> um, but, you know, so we get to stretch out, we have to still to deliver the placenta, you know, um, or, you know, a partner, partners who are with the patient, if they're going to be there, we hope that they have um, a general understanding of what they can do or they can call, they can always call 911 and they can talk them through different things as well. But if a baby is really that ready to come out, I don't mind playing catch, you know, because then the uterus is doing this thing, the baby is fully ready to come out, you know, hopefully we're talking about a full term baby here, right? So not a pre premature baby. And um, so if the baby's ready to come out, it could be hands off, you know, mom can push that when she's contracting and she doesn't have to push for hours. Moms can push for three or four times and deliver a baby. It's not a problem. And we love that when that happens. So having a backup plan. <laughs> yeah, that's really important. Thank you so much for your presentation. Just for one last question, I would like to ask if you have any advice for our future OBGYNs and pre-health students here. So breathe, right? Always, uh, you know, again, I, the focus is on wellness as well. Take care of yourself and whatever parameter that means, whether it's sleep, nutrition, um, just connections with, with people. You know, we've learned through COVID, you know, social connections are important, um, whether it's hands-on or not, because um, it really does affect people in, in their lives. And just, um, I, you know, as much as I love OBGYN, like don't limit yourself to not learning about radiology or learning about things that might apply to your field as well. Um, see if you can shadow an OBGYN, both in an office and in a hospital setting. You know, if there is a, a labor center, um, then, you know, those, those places might have students or certain days that students can go in to, to better get a sense of how the day is, is running. Um, you know, I, you know, my last name is a zoo tech. So for medical students, I used to have zoosisms, you know, because of things to do and not to do. And one of those is don't draw blood on the same side that an IV is running because, you know, then you have a lab level come back super, super high or super low, then it, you're really just drawing it from where the IV was running. So there are things that the students learn as we're on the floor that we realize, okay, let's, let's not do that again. So, um, and just, you know, you know, you want to be able to compartmentalize a little bit where if there's a really rough case where a patient doesn't make it or it's a really high energy, high intense case, have something that you can do to have some downtime to really reflect and decompress and have, have a trusted person that you can share how you're feeling with and be honest about it. You know, we used to um, have um, a the opportunity to have a group meeting after a tough day just to kind of talk about what happened and what could we have done any differently if there was anything we could have done or or how we can move forward. So there's many ways to um, to handle stress and the, the chaos and the, the energy that's there and you just want to be able to have the outlet that works for you. And if there isn't the outlet, find an outlet. Wow, thank you so much. Just before I start up the wrap up presentation, uh, some students have been asking me for your contact information just to ask you more questions. Um, are you able to, are you uh, comfortable in supplying your email? Yes, so it's just my first name dot last name at Toro, T-O-U-R-O dot E-D-U. So you can see, um, um, all right, so Stephanie dot Zuzutech at Toro dot E-D-U. Awesome, thank you so much. So now I'll be going into the wrap up presentation. Let me just share my slides real quick. 
Thank you so much for that awesome presentation. That was so informative. Um, I'm sure the students found it informative as much as I did. And in spite and and um in looking at that, I think we learned so much from you. Um, so I think reflecting is really important, especially when you have when you have such wonderful speakers like you. Um, some three questions we asked. Uh, our students to reflect on is what brought you to the session today? What are three major takeaways you got? And what do you want to learn more about after this session? This writing reflection isn't required, but we do encourage you to submit this to our website for like a review and you can publish and you can have it published on our website. Um, I'm the editor in chief and I really like to uh, see your reflections on our session today and our previous sessions as well. And it is, I would say thank you for taking the time to attend as well. And your questions were amazing. Thank you so much. <laughs> so if you want to learn more about pre-health shadowing and get involved in our program, we offer asynchronous volunteering and applications for team members in which you can lead initiatives and projects in large groups of people. Um, some uh, kind of things we can do are graphic design, social media pro promotion, fundraising, podcasting, a lot of things that are going on at PHS you can be a part of. We are accepting team member applications if you want to take on a more active role and lead projects like us or asynchronously volunteer, you can click the respective links in the chat. So once again, we are humbly asking that if you are financially able to or know someone who can, that you do donate to PHS via Venmo or PayPal. It costs a lot for us to keep our program running and keeping our website and Zoom free to all of you and accessible to all of you. So if you know someone who can afford it and if you uh, can, please consider donating. Otherwise, we simply ask everyone to spread the word about pre-health shadowing so we can reach as many students as possible and people are getting a variety of education. Um, so we do uh, do our best to have a variety of healthcare professionals from OTs, PAs, MDs, and DOs like we have here today. And just ensuring that everyone knows about pre-health shadowing is really nice. So spreading the word we do ask everyone to spread the word about us so now for, for the part we've all been waiting for how to earn a digital certificate for your virtual shadowing hours from the session today so first you will be going onto our website which is prehealthshadowing.com you are going to find our professional which is stephanie's dr stephanie's zutek we you will find her page on our website and sign up for the free course it says take this course, just click that button and you're able to view the recording of the session after today. But on the quiz, there are 10 questions which are multiple choice. You need to get 70% right to be able to earn your certificate. We do allow two attempts for the assessment. And once you open it, you have 30 minutes to take the quiz. The quiz is open indefinitely. So you are able to take it tonight, tomorrow, next week or next month. It really doesn't matter. But once you open it, you have 30 minutes and you have two attempts to get a 70%. Once you have passed with a 70%, you can click the Finish Course button at the bottom of the professional's page and download your certificate verifying your virtual shadowing hours. If you happen to miss a part of the session today or want to go back and view all of the amazing sessions we've had in the past, this is our 98th session, so we've had a lot of sessions in the past with so many health professionals, so be sure to check them out. Um, our sessions are recorded on our website, so you can look at the professionals and select which ones you're interested in and view the recording there. We also have a YouTube channel, it's called Pre-Health Shadowing, and you can view our sessions there as well. They're all recorded and today's session will be recorded and uploaded within 24 hours. And you are able to take assessments for any of them, uh, especially the ones in the past. So after that, I'll talk to you guys about our social media. Um, we do make sure that everyone knows about our upcoming sessions through our Instagram and our email list. So if you haven't already, be sure to follow our Instagram and sign up for the email list so you receive our weekly emails and uh, get notified when sessions are coming up. And uh, the, some of the events we have, we also notify them through our email list. We are currently booked every weekday until June. So make sure you keep up to date with our sh uh, virtual shadowing sessions. I hope to see you guys in our future sessions. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Zuzutek and all my students and um, asking the questions. Um, if you have any questions for myself and other team members, we will be happy to answer them at the end. This shadowing session is officially over and I invite you all to log off. 
Thank you, Dr. Zinchek, for being here.